What's up, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of the Panther Talk podcast that we have for you today. This is technically a bonus episode, and today we have the amazing David Harris that's going to be our guest today. If you don't know, David Harris is a multiple Grammy award-winning producer and songwriter, as well as an Emmy award-winning producer and songwriter as well. He's a graduate of our music program here at LaGrange College, and we're so happy to have him back and come and talk about his experience, his time that he spent in New York City as well, and all of his accolades and things and how he actually got to that level. So I really hope you enjoy the interview today with David Harris. excited that you're here, David. Thank you so much again for, for doing this and for being here. Um, and congrats again for, first of all, the Emmy as uh, that you just won. Thank you. Um, all the Grammys as well. Thank and you. Um, also for being honored here at the Grange College Thank as you. well. Yeah. Um, super uh, happy for all those accolades and stuff. The first thing I was going to ask you about is... Now that you have all the accolades and all the stuff and the and the, <laughs> the big money and everything now, um, I'm really interested to see if you remember your first moment of... This is when I really want to do, I really want to do songwriting, mm -hmm. music production. Was there a moment that you kind of think back on now yeah, after everything? Yeah, um, I think it was, it really kind of connected with me once. Uh, my, I have, well, I'm the seventh of eight, Man, but yeah. the brother right above me, Alonzo, he went to, well, all of us went to LaGrange, but he went to LaGrange as well, music major. And um, just kind of grown up in a musical house, had a family band. Um, and when I was younger, just trying to figure out my place yeah. and everything, yeah. and I started writing songs first. But it wasn't until he, around high school, mm -hmm. uh, late middle school, high school, when he came to college and um, he was making tracks to my songs, and he left. So he was like, listen, I'll show you how to do yeah. some programming in the motif. And that's kind of where I was like, okay, I think I found my niche. Yeah. Because I was like, you know, dabbling in, in art and, and design and stuff like that while I was writing songs. But it was then I was like, all right, cool. This is, yeah, this this is my the, era. Yeah, right here. This, this is, is the, the moment. Yeah. So it comes out of having to kind of figure it out yourself. I yeah. Mean, really, basically, even essentially. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, having those influences, like, you know, the older siblings and doing it and just trying to compete, not compete yeah. in that way, but just like trying to keep up. Yeah. yeah you yeah, know, exactly. And kind of also, carve out my own lane for myself. And so when he introduced me to that aspect of it, it just started really clicking for me, yeah. you know, what I really wanted to do. Yeah. With it. Yeah. Man. Uh, late with, bloomer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you done, yeah, you done well for late bloomer. Um, <laughs> with that um, that decision and stuff, was your family supportive of music? Yeah. And you been kind of pursuing that career at yeah, all? Yeah, you know, I think in the beginning, obviously, you know, my parents, they were the first ones in their family to, to get a college education, mm -hmm. my mom and dad, actually. And so they really pushed education in the mm -hmm. house. Um, they did kind of give us, you know, as long as we went to a liberal arts college, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we couldn't, they didn't really care what we majored in or anything. So, I mean, as far as music, I don't know. They're they're older, right? So yeah. it's like to have a career in, in making music, you know, it's, it's, like, a little, it's a little different. It's like, what is yeah. that really? You're like, you know, are you going to teach with that? Yeah. Which, I do now, uh, part of what I do, but um, it was just kind of a, a weird space. They didn't really pull back from it. It was just like, we don't really understand what you're, what you're going to do yeah. with it. With yeah. the vibe, what the vibe is. What yeah. the vibe is, right. <laughs> you know, because my dad come from there, you get discovered. You know, that's yeah. his thing. You get discovered, you know. <laughs> um, so just the concept of building out a career yeah. and creating music was kind of a foreign concept within the confines of, you know, what they were exposed to and their understanding of, you know, how to be a progressive, yeah. you know, person in yeah. society. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, well, I mean, shouts out to the family for yeah. for being supportive. Yeah. Um, with that, um, with your decision to, to pursue songwriting and mm -hmm. do that as a career and the family kind of supporting you, yeah. um, I guess I'm wondering, is, was there like a... You try to find more outlets for outside of the family band and stuff mm -hmm. to kind of learn more about music, to kind of get involved in yeah. the community music-wise. Did you kind of look for that kind of stuff? Yeah, that happened really here okay. at LaGrange. Oh, yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously, I grew up in the church, right? So exposed to a lot of gospel music, uh, black gospel music. Then I'm from Manchester, so oh, the yeah. only... My parents are, like, not only educators, but also pastors and yeah. stuff, so... 
the only Christian, 24-7 Christian radio station I had was Christian Contemporary oh, man, music. Yeah. So I kind of got exposed to like pop Christian music and black gospel growing up my whole life. So yeah. I had so those two worlds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't really start getting into uh, secular music like hip hop and R&B until like middle school um, and high school. <clears throat> but um, yeah, when I got to, to campus... It's just like, you know, being able to collaborate with people with different musical backgrounds, different musical tastes, mm -hmm. taking some of the courses, getting exposed to classical music, um, you know, more uh, and kind of just like being able to like just dive yeah. head first into everything. So like I remember um, I had a, a colleague or a peer at that time, uh, Mary Hannah. Uh, who was like a folk artist, and so we, Interesting, yeah. so we went on this whole like I think we called it psychedelic folk hop, yeah, thing yeah, where we just like created like this weird album colliding both of our worlds, yeah. Um, that was fun. Um, so that was really exciting. I yeah. played it in the jazz combo for for three years. Oh man, yeah, or uh, four years actually. I think I played all four years. Maybe it was that. I don't remember. But I played in jazz combo as well. Took Latin um, percussion. Oh yeah. Um, that was offered. Took classical voice, concert choir. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I really just wanted to kind of like expose my palate to different things outside yeah. of the comfort zone of what I would gravitate towards, um, and that's really helped me a lot along the way. As yeah. Well. Yeah. So take it back to the Grange. You've had a great experience here. Yeah. Um, do you have any? super fond memories or things that you look back and laugh on or just some great memories from LaGrange, especially the music department, but yeah, yeah. any of that? Yeah, I mean, I have a, a really important moment. I think this is probably one of the most pivotal moments, um, but two, I give you two mm -hmm. um, moments. One was, um, you know, I was struggling with biology. Oh, man. And uh, Likewise, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was struggling with biology and... Um, um, my parent, the first time I took music theory, um, I was like, okay, because I wasn't, I was undecided. I'll give you context. Yeah. So I did music, but I wanted to go into more of the business thing. Yeah, so I, see, I was yeah. considering majoring in business. And I was like, oh, I'll take a few music classes and just see. I didn't, ha I really didn't have a strong background in music theory at yeah. all because we grew up playing in church. Yeah. And, play by you know, ear. Yeah, play by yeah. ear. Mm -hmm. Like Alonzo was probably the first one who really, I had an older brother, who, uh, Antipas, he was the first. Okay. And I found it, to, he majored in theology and, okay. and New Testament studies and music. Nice. But um, Alonzo was like, the like he just locked in. Yeah. Theory just really locked in. So, But I was just like trying to figure it out. So <clears throat> I took a theory course. And then, okay. Um, biology, I was struggling in and my parents, uh, came up and was like, all right, we got to, we got to figure something <laughs> out. Figure, figure out what you're doing. <laughs> so, like, man, <laughs> so Lee was my advisor. Lee was oh, my advisor yeah, at the yeah. time. And so they, they sat with him, you know, being loving parents, all concerned. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they were like, listen, like, like, like talk to us, help us. Yeah. And so. Lee was just like, nah, y'all don't understand. Like th there's something special, you know, with this guy. Yeah. And um, that was a pivotal moment for me to see someone see something in me that yeah. I had not necessarily seen in myself yet. Even though I had aspirations to become at that point, like I want to be a producer, blah, 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 for someone else to kind of uh, affirm that within yeah. me and and see it, that was a very pivotal moment for me creatively. And, um, and I mean, that my parents were just like, all right, cool. Like, yeah, if you say so, you, yeah. yeah. Like, he's like, we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll deal with it then. Right, <laughs> right, we'll figure it out. But um, no, nah, that was a really important moment for me. Um, and another uh, important moment, which I talk about this moment, like, to all my classes, yeah. clients, everything, uh, Dr. Turner. Oh, man, yeah. Um, when I took uh, music theory, uh, I think it was... Two no music theory one. Mm. I took music theory one, and he had the you compose and recording yeah, part of it absolutely, right. Absolutely, yeah. So I was like, man, I killed the score. I felt so great. Killed the score. Had a dope recording, and I came. And this is in CB, the recital hall in oh, CB. Yeah. And so I printed my CD as a data CD and not an audio CD. Oh. So I go in. I'm like feeling myself. I, I pop it in. It's not playing back. I'm freaking out. And he's just sitting there looking. Yeah. He's and serious guy. Very yeah. matter of fact manner. He was <laughs> he like, business. right. He was like, listen, in life, sometimes you only have one chance. Mm -hmm. 
And so I'm going to drop you a letter grade. Even though your score looks great, Jeez. I'll let you go upstairs and print your CD. And hopefully you can come back and play it. God. So I ran upstairs and he was like, always check um, check your stuff before your presentation. Yeah. Right. So that taught me a very valuable tip. Like when I tell you that story, it hunts me to this yeah. day. <laughs> like when I go to meetings and stuff, um, I'm always there like, hey, you know, where's the ox? Where's yeah, the bow? Check it out. I want to check it out before we press play. So that really, very, yeah. small lesson. But it cost me a lot of great yeah. on on that uh, project, and yeah, I never forgot that. Yeah, and I and I got to tell him that um, before he passed. Yeah, so make rest. Yeah, 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 man, Shelly. Um, yeah, he um, I had, I had a similar situation, and he means business, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it pays off. It really does. It makes you a better person, <laughs> right? Way better, way more prepared. Yeah. Um. So yeah, um, super appreciative yeah, of that. We and, play a lot of pranks on Doctor Turner. Yeah. Too, <laughs> <which is funny. laughs> Really fun. I got to tell you, I got to tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he had this sign in the uh, old computer lab that says, "No, absolutely no drinking and uh, no, a- absolutely no drinks or food in oh, the lab. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and I had a, a friend of mine, Rachel, uh, she would always have something. And he was like, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> so one day we were like, yo, we should change his sign. So we print up a sign, same font, same everything. Same everything. <laughs> and it says, absolutely food and drink in the uh, lab. So we all come up. We were like, all right, cool. When he start lecturing, we're just going like, to pull out like Everybody. all these snacks and stuff. <laughs> Throw them on the table. Right. <laughs> so as soon as he started, we go, choo, choo, choo. and he's turning red. And he's like, "Can you guys can't read. It says, <laughs> absolutely drinks it. You rotten kids, you know. So uh, that was a fun memory. And then he let us he let us do our thing that that class, but yeah, we had to change his sign. Yeah, right after that. Yeah, yeah but that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> he was a good sport. He had a good sense of humor, man. He, uh, he had a good one. So uh, having those great memories of Lagrange, you eventually you graduated, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And you left here. So what is yep. your time after Lagrange was like? What did you do kind of when you left? Yeah, here? I went straight to grad school. Man. Okay. Went straight to grad school. I only applied. Uh, maybe not the wisest thing, All right, but brave I did man. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I only applied to NYU. Mm. Um, they had an M-Tech program. And I was trying to figure out a location where I can kind of start tapping into the industry. So I looked yeah. at L.A. and New York. Um, at the time, like, you had the business really was ran out of New York, so you had the big uh, labels out of there. And it was on the East Coast still, easy, easier to get back home. Cause I ain't know anybody in New York. That's fair. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I applied to NYU. Uh, was fortunate enough to get in, and like that grind began. Just trying to figure out what was going on, who should I know? Yeah. Um, learn the city. Again, I didn't have any family or friends, anybody in New York. Right, yeah, so you're yeah. on your own. I, I was on my own. own. Um, but it was great. You know, if I hadn't grown up yet, I grew up then. You know, yeah, because you gotta gotta be wise, you gotta be watchful, not paranoid, but like, you know, being aware of your surroundings. Um, yeah, and then I started applying for internships, internships, yeah. internships, internships. Um, didn't land anything through the NYU portal, um, so I went to Craigslist. Oh yeah, and then sent out about fifty, a hundred applications, and heard from a few, uh, uh, heard from a few places. And landed in a spot um, where I kind of launched my career, yeah, okay. MBK oh, Entertainment. Yeah, okay. yeah. so, um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answered. It does, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you I can you. give you that yeah. long story, too. But. <laughs> you're at NYU, you're getting an internship, MBK, yeah. um, and done that stuff. Um, did you, I know you said you're on your own in, mm-hmm. in New York. Did you come across anybody that kind of you... It kind of turned into a mentor that kind of was like, here's how the game works a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, once I landed an internship, mm-hmm. so a, a guy by the name of G Flowers was at the time uh, head of A&R at NBK, mm-hmm. and it was a management production company. And when we met, we just hit it off. He was from Virginia. I'm from the South. Yeah. He's left-handed. I'm left-handed. <laughs> he was a Virgo. I'm a Virgo. Yeah. Um, Meant to be, yeah. Yeah, his brothers do music. I did music. His brothers did music, mm-hmm. and my brothers did music. So... He was a little bit older. I'd been in the game for a while. And so he kind of took me under his wings. Mm-hmm. He was like my first manager uh, figure and yeah. and kind of help maneuver me through the NBK. Even though I was putting change in meters and 
Cleaning bathrooms, yeah, man. Yeah, setting up coffee. sessions, yeah. yep, all, that. <laughs> all that stuff, yeah, <laughs> all the fun stuff. Um, but it allowed me um, to kind of be in a room with some interesting people. Yeah. At the same time, like producers who were on the rise, yeah. who like months later exploded, like yeah. Alex the Kid. Oh yeah. Um, man, yeah. If you don't, if you're not familiar with them, Imagine Dragons, yeah. Love the Way You Lie, um, uh, Ex Ambassadors. Um, X Ambassador signed to his label, Imagine Dragon signed to his label. He did a lot of big songs for Rihanna and like dudes just yeah, into the tech world deal, crazy. Yeah. So I met him and to this day we we're really good friends. And, yeah. and I met him, he had a session with someone. I was interning. Yeah. And he was like, his career just started. And I'll never forget the conversation. I was um I got to speak with him a little bit. And he was like, yeah, man, I don't know, man. Like, I got this. He's from London, so I'm not going to do it bad. yeah. The British but, accent. The British accent. Shout out to our British friend. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but um, he's just like, yeah, man, I got this record. Um, I thought Rihanna was going to cut it, but mm-hmm. I don't think it's happening, blah, 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 da, 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 da. I was really hoping that happened, but yeah. it doesn't look like it's happening. And Eminem ended up cutting it and putting Rihanna, Rihanna on that on record. Anyway. And that that was Love the Way You Lie. Man. And um, right. after that, it's just like, pew. Yeah. And then we lost... We we would talk a good then we lost contact for a few years. Yeah. And then he did a session with um her and mm-hmm. he was asking like who you work with, whatever. She told him me and then I came to the session and he was like uh, there it is. We Bro, back at it. You know? <laughs> and um yeah, we've been really tight Man. ever ever since then again. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know why how I got on that story, but the internship. Yeah, the internship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So at the internship. Keep, keep me in line. Yeah. Man, keep me in line. <laughs> at the internship too. Um, I know I feel like every producer or songwriter has the story of like a dude couldn't show up. I had to run yeah. a session. Do yeah. you have any stories yes. like that where you had to step in and do anything like that? Absolutely. <laughs> Engineer did not show up. And I, 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 to this day I don't know what happened. I remember his name, but I'm not gonna say it. Yeah, that's fair. Um <laughs> But for whatever reason, he just didn't show up. And so G called me yeah. and was like, um, yo, do you know how to run Logic? Because they were doing like a production um, studio yeah. where it was like production and audio. So that Pro Tools and Logic, but I think the artist liked recording in Logic yeah. for whatever reason. He was like, now this time, like Logic was a newer DAW. So they probably be like freshly bought out or something like that. Yeah. So okay. it, was, it was the iteration after seven. So I think it was like... Um, what was the uh, uh, Im- Imag- uh When was it? E- is it e- not E Magic or E Magic? Yeah, yeah. So it was E Magic Seven, Logic Seven, then Logic Seven Point Nine or Eight or something yeah. like. So it was the Virgin right after that. And so it was like, man, we don't know a lot of people who can do it. Can you run it? I was yeah. like, well, that happened to be my dog yeah, choice. Don't mind if I do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I stepped in, and um, that day, Alicia Keys's musical director at the time, Andre Gill was producing the gospel act they had. Oh, man, yeah. And um, he just, we just vibed. And he's like, yo, I want him at all, this, all my sessions. Man. And so that's how I kind of transitioned from not not only cleaning bathrooms, but yeah. also doing some sessions and cleaning and bathrooms. Cleaning bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Life don't get much better. Right, right. Get to smell some toilets and, and press record. Right? Um <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so that kind of started that, and then that that led to me writing. Their manager I, I came to the the CEO's brother yeah. Conrad came to the studio early one day, and we started talking. And he asked me about my background, and he's like, oh, "I'm looking for a CCM type song for my group." Uh, and we were just in conversation, yeah. and he was like, "But you wouldn't know anything about that, you know?" He kind of like that's his personality. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I was like, "Actually, I wrote a couple things for my chapel band back home." And he was like, really? So I sang him, a, I was telling the small group earlier, I, oh, yeah. I sang him a, a, a chorus of the song that I wrote for the child man. I couldn't remember the verses, though. Oh, okay. And he was like, yeah, um, you know, I love you to demo it and play it for me tomorrow. So I hit my boy. He was still here. And I'm like, can you go to Henry Computer Lab and see? Oh, I yeah. give you my login information. Can you find the lyrics? He couldn't find the lyrics. I had the chapel in Quincy. It was like, you got it in the in the yeah. songbook. He's like, be somewhere in yeah, he's like, yeah, he was like, it was the weirdest thing. The song just kind of disappeared. Man. And um, so I ran home and rewrote the verses Man. and demoed it in my dorm um, and came back the next day, played for him. He loved it. The band demoed it. And then that led to me start writing and producing more for the band and Man. eventually executive producing their debut uh, project. And it debuted number one on Billboard. Yeah, and sure. we had um, 
like I think it's like three or four top twenty singles off the gospel mm-hmm. singles off that. So that was kind of the genesis of that iteration of my career. Yeah. So, so um, you re- seem to have made a really smooth transition working in the contemporary Christian gospel mm-hmm. world to also working in like R and B and hip hop. How did you kind of like? Because I mean, it happens, of course, but like, I feel like it, <laughs> the switch is kind of uh, interesting I mean, to me. It, How did you? It really goes back to. Um, broadening your palette yeah. of music and really understanding sonically what's happening, mm-hmm. right? And I've always been um, of the progressive thought, even when I do like Christian and, and gospel music, to try to push sonically the, the genre forward. Yeah. So to me, there's no differentiation mm-hmm. in the sound quality of the two. It's really just context yeah. and con- you know content. So even if you think about like the earlier iterations of gospel. It was popular music of the time yeah. combined with more of a uh, inspirational uh, context, yeah. right? So, you know, the birth of go- traditional gospel is jazz and blues combined. So it's kind of that same yeah. concept. But you think about soul music is gospel and R&B, you yeah, know? That's true. So um, uh, funk, gospel, um, rhythm and blues and you know uh blue uh r&b and soul is fun you, so yeah, you go across for me yeah so for me it's not even a uh necessarily a real transition yeah, that's fair. Yeah. yeah it's just more so what am i talking about is yeah. it secular or sacred content? yeah 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 you know we're talking about Jesus right yeah. right exactly <laughs> so um for me the soul of it is really about the soul of it and the quality of sound so and also the relationship. So even when I did that that particular gospel album, it was very progressive yeah. in sound. And that same kind of methodology I applied to no matter what genre yeah. of music I'm doing. No yeah. What. So having that, that outlook on sound and like sound designing, mm-hmm. how did you, this is kind of a, a double question, I'll ask the second part in a second, but how did you come up with kind of your sound um, that you kind of, did you kind of like take it from some influences in the yeah. past or you just kind of, how did well, that come about? Yeah, a little bit of combination of both. It's also like, you know, uh, so again, going to my brother's Yeah. Own, I mean, when I say keys. Yeah, because he was playing on the, I saw the Her yeah. not a Tiny he, Desk. Yeah, he's our MD. Yeah. He's oh, so see, oh, wow. So yeah, yeah he does yeah. this for real. So, yeah, yeah, nah, yeah. <laughs> he's legit. I got him his gig, but. Yeah. Gig, but. <laughs> 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 Get him his way. Right. <laughs> I hooked him up, man. Don't I, don't, I want my percentage, man. <laughs> um, but nah, nah, I mean, he's a prolific yeah. pianist, organist. He started on drums. Man. And like, so, I'm answering, I had yeah, to say yeah, that. Say sure. that. So, I, I play keys, but I never say I'm a pianist yeah. or keyboardist because of him. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. that helped shape my sound. Yeah. So, but I was a songwriter, so melody I was quite natural. So a lot of my production is like melodic driven, yeah, with harmony kind of comping around it. But I'm a drummer, yeah, oh yeah. So McField, right. Man. So yeah. everything is about like rhythm and drum, and because I don't want to call myself a, a you know, a keyboardist, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm very like very intentional. Yeah, about, we glide. When, yeah, 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 exactly. So <laughs> so that helped shape my sound because I respect. I mean, and then there are, there are colleagues of mine say, bro, like, seriously, like, just say you play keys, yeah. right? But I'm just like, no, you don't understand. Yeah. You don't understand. <laughs> you got to see my brother. He, right, yeah. right. <laughs> like, he play keys. Yeah. <laughs> I write songs. <laughs> so that kind of helped shape. And then producers who I gravitated towards kind of felt that same energy, like Timberland and Pharrell. Yeah. Um, even though Teddy Teddy plays, like, but his production oh, yeah. is a little bit different. Um also inspired by Quincy Jones, I listen to Off the Wall at least, uh, you know, He's once a, bar a week. Man. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, I mean, those are, are, are the people who I kind of look up to, and I and I got to meet and and um, talk often with one of those one of those guys who are on my Mount, uh, Mount Rushmore man. producer, and it's like it's been amazing. Like I'm still a fan, yeah, of music. So it's like um, Jason Joshua. Uh, mixing engineer introduced Absolutely. me to Timberland. Oh man! And 
do like <laughs> saying, bro. just the conversation. Like, yeah. and I don't care. Like, I'm not a like I don't fan out. Yeah, don't fan girl out. Like yeah, that. I don't fan girl out about nothing. <laughs> but um, my wife knows like Timberland is one of those guys. Yeah. So uh, when he was Facetime me, I'm just like. This is real. Someone take a picture. Right. <laughs> right. And I'm like, yeah, what's good? What's good, man? Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> man. But, um, but, you know, those are one of the, those are like the guys who I kind of look up to, um, what they've done, that sound. Like yeah. they really pushed the boundaries to me of popular music. Yeah. Um, and Max Martin just fundament, fundamentally as a songwriter, man, yeah. but as a pop songwriter, but like, um, Pharrell, Tim, Quincy, um, um, yeah, those guys. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, having found your own sound and everything, and you kind of got some great influences mm -hmm. um, that you pull in from. Um, when you're, this is now like the process. I'm kind of interested in. Mm -hmm. When you're working with an artist, um, how are you crafting a sound that works for that artist? Yeah. Cause that's I feel like it's difficult to really yeah. match it with whatever they got going on. You know what? I learned to be a really good listener, mm -hmm. and I think as a producer, um, outside of like having your own carbon print, is understanding that you are at service to the art mm -hmm. and the artist you're working with. So, for me, I always listen first and create after. Mm -hmm. So if I have an opportunity to sit with an artist, like a her or whatever, it's like, okay, what's going on in life? Mm -hmm. What's inspiring you? What, what are you listening to? And we have these in-depth conversations. I remember vividly the first session I had with Kehlani, um, we probably talked for almost two hours. Man. And by the end of the conversation, the song was written. You know, So yeah. it was like, what's it going on in your life? Yeah. yeah, what's going on in your life? Blah, 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 blah. And she felt it's creating an environment yeah. where artists can feel comfortable. Yeah, just feel open. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so sometimes I'll play chords or play around with sounds while we're having conversations and kind of studying and reading body movement. Yeah. Or, you know, sometimes you put on a sound in there in mid conversation, that'd be like, it's going to hurt right like, there. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> we'll stay that. with that sound. <laughs> you know? that down. Yeah. <laughs> Write that down. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, you know, for me, um, it's just really like creating an environment that really pulls out inspiration yeah. from the artist. So that's how I kind of create. And and sometimes I, I see with the artist and from that conversation, they may not know where they're trying to go, uh, yeah. but they're influenced by all these things. So in listening, I can say, all right, yo, listening to what you're saying, check this idea out. What yeah. if we did this, like with Kaylani, for example, she was telling me about her background from the Bay, how she loved R&B, loved hip hop, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, what if we made like a really hard hitting R&B? Yeah. And at this time, this is like pre-Trap Soul, yeah, the, first, yeah, the yeah. first project. So it was kind of like, the I always jokingly say like I'm one of the, uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 the one of the pillars <laughs> yeah. in Trap Soul um, because that project was uh, pre-Tiller. Oh, yeah, and if yeah. you go back and listen yeah, to Cloud yeah. 19, yeah. you can kind of hear the influence yeah. of that project on what he did. And then we came back with her stuff, which is kind of a That's similar kind. Yeah, yeah. offshoot of, of that. So, um, yeah, I think I answered your question. Yeah, you, you did, have to absolutely. keep me on track. Yeah, man. you're, you're answering <laughs> it. I'm not, you're on the money with it. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, so, you, you're responsible for. Her big album, uh, the Grammy win, um, responsible for was a collaborator. Was a collaborator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kaylani's breakout um, work as well. Yeah. Um, and you talk, you've spoken about being an executive producer as mm -hmm. well. I'm interested in what kind of things are you doing as an executive producer for an album like hers? Yeah. Um, Grammy winning album. Yeah. So I mean, there are many roles. Um, obviously, you create mm -hmm. and co-write with the artist, but it's also objectively looking at what the project needs mm -hmm. and identifying other creative people who can um, help yeah. nurture that and, and, and provide the best music and inspiration for it. So it's a selfless job in a sense too. Like sometimes you have the vibe and sometimes you don't, yeah. right? And you have to be willing enough to be servant to what you're trying to accomplish and bring in the right people. So 
Uh, I brought in DJ Camper. Yeah. You know, I yeah, brought in yeah. D Mao, who wasn't on the first project, but came back. Yeah, the second time around. Yeah, second time around. Um, different co-writers, Umbre. Um, mm. I found her on SoundCloud. And was like, oh, you gotta come to to, to New York. Yeah. Um, so as an executive, it's kind of like, all right, once you've established that trust with the artist and what you're collectively trying to accomplish, it's like, all right, okay, now I have to move outside of myself. Or sometimes yeah. is getting the vibe. It's more curating the vibe, though. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's establishing one or two songs. And man, like, okay, this is what we're trying to build. All right, yo, I love what you're doing. Yeah. I think you can enhance this. You're dope. We yeah. should bring you in. Okay, engineers, blah blah blah. Sitting with the mix, helping with the, um, with the uh, with the uh, arrangement of the yeah. of the of the project. All that stuff is important. So, it's 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 not monolithic. Yeah, you know, you at a lot all. Of hats. Yeah, yeah, you gotta wear different different hats to. And I also help with the creative rollout of it, the packaging, oh, how the marketing, aspect yeah, marketing as well. aspect. Yeah, um, every executive don't. Yeah, but. Um, I just happened to be able to help with that at that time. So uh, that was really cool. Yeah. I was, yeah. I'm thinking about the marketing aspect, too, because I remember when uh, she was coming out, I think it was a big deal that no one kind of knew. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no one kind of knew her name. Yeah. No, she wasn't really showing her face like yeah. that. So how did, what kind of decision making went behind yeah, that? Yeah, so it's really crazy. So she's pretty much a prodigy, mm -hmm. right? So, and she had been, she got signed at like 12 Jeez, and insane. was working on a project forever felt like and they had her working with all the biggest artists all the biggest producers and writers in the game and nothing yeah. was really clicking so her manager came to me and was like um yeah i just want to put a, a project together and I, at the time he was working develop another another project that at the time had more momentum yeah so he was like listen you can i make you ep of it just like help me put a little project yeah. together so the idea came um, again, been a good listener. She and I was talking, and she was talking about different things she was experiencing in high school at the time. And we wrote a song uh, called "Her." Mm -hmm. Interesting. And the concept was she was like the other girl next door. So she wasn't the girl next door. Uh, the she was other, the other girl other next girl. door. <laughs> and she was saying, like, she wished she was her. Mm, man. And so that kind of spawned into, like, a deeper conversation and how we all wish that we were something yeah. or someone else at some point or like we look at, at up to things or we look at what appears uh, to be better than what we're doing. It's like, man, I wish I had that. I wish I was doing that. I was like, that's a universal yeah. feeling. Like it's not just an isolated. Yeah, it's not just you. Right, it's yeah. not just you. So I was like, man, we could really use this and like kind of build out this. So the initial idea went from the other girl next door to writing the song to naming just a project her. Ah, uh, yeah. Right? And so just like just using that pronoun just to just like everybody, yeah, you know, this is it. an yeah. inclusive thing, right? Exactly. And so it was like we use the silhouette. You, anybody can just put themselves yeah, exactly. in the silhouette, right? And so uh, she was like, oh, I love it. Um, went to the label. They loved it. And I was like, well, why don't we just... We just don't put a name on it, yeah, right at all. It's just just leave it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so then we had a big. This is like super behind, yeah, behind the curtains. Um, had a big conversation, um, and everybody's like, "Well, the movie her just came out. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> like it's gonna be hard to Google. It's gonna be this, blah blah." blah. <laughs> so my position was, well, if they Google hers music, there it is. You know, they're gonna find it. A B, what if we made it stand for something deeper than just her? Yeah. And so from that birth, having everything revealed, ah. which is the irony of it because it's like, well, everything, the person is concealed, but the emotion is revealed. Man. So that was kind of the marketing idea. And it was like, okay, cool. You know, everyone's <laughs> like, cool with that. And so, yeah, so that was kind of the... The birth of that. Sheesh, man. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of thought. Uh, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of process went into that. Um, so talking about executive production, yep. talking about uh, marketing yep. we just spoke about. Um, you have your own, is it production company? Yep. Is it production progressive company. music? Uh, yeah. So I'm interested in what made you kind of want to start your own production company? What are some of the things that you yeah. have to do with that and all yeah. that stuff? So I always wanted to kind of, the vision, again, studying like, the Dre's and the Pharrell's and the Teddy Riley's and Quincy Jones. 
I always wanted to kind of have verticals. Yeah. From once I got into the game, I want to sign other producers. I want to have other writers. I want to have artists. So the production company is that leg yeah. of what I'm doing, right? Okay. And um, so through that, I've mentored a lot of producers and a lot of writers. I'm now signing writers and yeah. producers to that entity. And um, so that's pretty much the... But I gravitate towards disruptors and yeah. like people who kind of color outside the line, like the Ubers. Yeah, the, that cookie cutter. Yeah, that exactly. type of energy, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's kind of that. And so I, I have a few artists that are in development now um, with that. And I'm, I've also just started like a, a label oh, nice. offshoot from that, which probably come sooner than later, uh, Water to Wine. All right now. So that's Amen, coming. praise God. There we go. Okay. <laughs> come from the script, uh, biblical, uh, obviously, Yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, so that whole idea of progression and changing things that f seem or feel ordinary. Yeah. But you kind of see the extraordinary or the potential in it. And it's, it's kind of a nod to, if I can tie it all back in, yeah. to when Lee saw Man. the wine in the water mm -hmm. that my, you know, that, that was before there everybody in time. So. Um, and progressive music is just like forward, going back to the idea of like just pushing everything forward, Man. sonically forward. So, yeah, so that's the inspiration behind those things. Man, okay. Nothing crazy. Yeah, yeah. nothing wild. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> too crazy. Um, so, the production company and stuff, yeah. I'm interested in. This is a specific question now. Yeah. If you're you're still working with labels and stuff like yeah. that, when you work with labels, how are they kind of working with you? Is there some sort of deal that you all work out with their yeah. artists? Because I know they kind of get territorial about yeah, this stuff. Yeah, for sure. Like some projects, I'm uh, I'm brought in as a consultant, mm -hmm. but in those agreements, uh, I make sure that there's a clause that say, you know, me as a consultant is separate from me as a producer. Yeah. Should my services be utilized as a producer, as uh, a separate fee and separate agreement for that. As a consultant, it's kind of like an A&R consultant. Mm -hmm. I operate as an ex kind of as an executive producer, but I do more admin things, mm -hmm. um, help contact studios, negotiate rates with studios for the artists, book studio sessions, make sure all the credits and stuff turn in, kind of consult on, you know, with the artists, like, what do you think about this song? Blah, yeah. blah, blah, right? It's not all always producing. So, yeah, so different things. Um, if I come in as a producer, now the business is a bit different. It's more like, you know, we like it, we buy it. Yeah. So sometimes, oh, yeah, okay. yeah um, that's with the majors. Okay. Now with indie projects, is a little bit different. Um, most of the time it's kind of like, well, we'll, we, we'll pay. Yeah, um, and work it out. To work it out, mm -hmm. yeah, to get involved. And in the, in the fees are usually a little, bit, a little bit less unless you're working with, like, the prints of, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it depends. It's, it's, it's really, you get what you negotiate and you negotiate the best you can. Yeah. <laughs> you That's know? fair. Yeah. Yeah. How so, much are they, they let you? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So for me, it's like, you know, there, there, I do consultant work. I do executive production work. I do just a producer songwriter. Mm -hmm. You like the song. I recently had a song release on a new artist on Def Jam. I did the track 10 years. What was it? 2000? Yeah. What is it? 13? Yeah. Did the track 10 years ago. Sheesh. And on my hard drive, I'm in a session with her. We created something new that's on her project as well. But she was like, what else you got in your hard drive? I'm just curious yeah, of, yeah. like, what old stuff you got. I never throw stuff away. Yeah. So, and I've organized my drive, like, you know, I think the furthest back I got now is, like, 2010 on Jeez. my main drive. Man. So I was like, all right, cool. 2014. Yeah, what, year you, what year you want? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I played it. She's like, man, I love this. I'm like, I, it's easy, 2014. Yeah. It's too easy, yeah. Right. So she was like, nah, I really love it. So it ended up being her single, brand new artist. So she's just kind of breaking the surface. But yeah, um, yeah so in that case, it was just like track already made. Yeah. And they loved it. They bought it. And it's out. Man. And yeah. <laughs> Sweet deal. <laughs> really, you did the work, but really didn't have to do too much work. Right, right, <laughs> right. And then sometimes you go in and you, you know, you create. From the ground up, I collaborate with different producers, and that's a different business too. Um, yeah. Where it's collaboration, and you know, you kind of um, the Snow Allegra song mm -hmm. I did. Um, 
she, me and this guy, Sensei Bueno, um, did this idea. This is an interesting story. Yeah. Actually, I got to tell this story. Please do. Um, so this track started out as an idea for her. Um, like back in 2017, 18, mm-hmm. for the for another project. She really liked the idea, but didn't it didn't really connect what she's doing at the time. So it's like, all right, cool, whatever. So I sent it to Kaylani, and Kaylani wrote to it. And uh, she sent it to me. I'm like, I'm like, this is really cool. Can you change um, the melody here because mm-hmm. it's not really hitting the uh, okay. the interval that we're playing? Yeah, it doesn't fit right. Yeah, <laughs> don't really fit right to me. <laughs> so I had somebody else read them or her song, sing the right uh, the thing, right, and send it back yeah. to her. I don't know. If she didn't like that. Or not it's <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, but I didn't hear anything back from her for a while, for like a year. It's, it's supposed to have been on her project. I forget the name of it. Where she's kind of looking over the fence. Oh, uh, I, yeah, yeah, I know that. Um, one. Mm-hmm. But she ended up not using it. So like a year later, she hit me, or her team hit me, mm-hmm. and was like, "Oh, we're thinking about putting this on a deluxe." Now the same day, uh, Sensei Bueno was in LA, oh, and he played the idea for Snow. Oh man! So he hit me the same day. <laughs> Kalani team hit me the same you day. You didn't make a choice now, <laughs> right? So I was like. He was like, man, what do you want to do? Like, I don't, you know. Yeah. Like, what do you want to do? You know, he's like, ah, whatever. So I'm like, well, let's see, you know, out of respect, let's see yeah. what, what Kaylani and I'm trying to do. So I was like, well, we're thinking about putting on a deluxe album and we're thinking about uh, a lot of thinking going yeah, on, right? And have some belief in here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Snow was like, well, and we were very, very transparent. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very important. Very transparent through this whole, it wasn't like not telling each side yeah. what was happening, right? Mm-hmm. So went to Snow and was like, listen, they really want this record. Like, and she was like, listen, we'll make a deal tonight for the record. I was like, think and do. do That's it. two yeah. different things. You to have me. my attention, yeah. Right. So, uh, <laughs> like, true enough, I was like, well, you know, email out, email our team and CC me or whatever. So, uh, no ID, her manager, because she sounded no ID, no yeah. ID, her manager, whatever, was all in email. I was like, Snow really want this song. What would it take? So, we gave him a number and whatever, and like, literally, that reply was done. Man. So I was like, okay, now I got to hit. <laughs> ah, ah, it didn't work out. <laughs> it didn't, didn't really work out. But I was like, but we'll remake something to your song. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she was like, all right, try it. But she ended up not really using it. But we got a Grammy nomination Man. from the Snow thing. So it worked out. Yeah, so you made the right choice. Yeah, yeah made yeah, the right absolutely. choice. Absolutely. So another long answer to the answer to well, the yeah, answer. Yeah, you but. did it. You answered it. And it was a good story. <laughs> um before we, I'm moving to Q and A here in a second, yeah, yeah. but I just want to commend you on your your ability to. You seem to segment entrepreneurship, business, and music and creativity super well. Yeah, I mean, you, you have, have to. The best. Yeah. You have to. To be quite honest with you, I think that's the thing, especially now in the climate yeah. of the industry, you have to be have an entrepreneur uh, mentality. Yeah, because it's more than just about making great music. And sometimes, yeah. you know, people make okay music yeah. and are really successful. Yeah. It's really about having that entrepreneurial mindset and thinking about how many verticals and streams you can create from yourself from what you love to do. And I know a lot of artists like, oh, business, I don't want to sell out. But yeah. I want to be able to support what I love to do. Exactly. You know what I mean? So I can have a passion project that may not make any money, but... It's what I love yeah, it's to what do. I would love to do. Yeah. So, so mm-hmm. for me, it's that it's that balance of entrepreneurship and art. Yeah. You know. Um, and you know, I got kids. Yeah. In the family. They got so. to eat. Okay. Yeah. They, they hungry so, every day. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Wow, man. <laughs> that six. The twins are six now. Every day after school is snack time. It's snack time. <laughs> so. <laughs> Tearing up the fridge, man. Right. It's like, huh, what check I got coming today? <laughs> Um, but yeah, man, so it's, it's really understanding the different avenues, whether it's television and film, whether it's on the record side, whether it's on the executive side, whether it's in the building, Yeah, you know, just really understanding different opportunities. I know writers and producers who are executives now or who are A&R people, yeah. and they still feel fulfilled in what they're doing even if they're not writing the records, but they help putting the records together. Yeah. So it's really just educating yourself on, okay, what are the different avenues, you know, yeah, that, that can, can, yeah, can, can branch from out from it. Yeah, myself into. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Man, that's some good advice. All right, folks. Um, I told them to prepare some questions here. 
um, right, to the best of your abilities. So we'll move to Q and A. Who got a question? Trenton. Yeah. So um, I know that you had a lot of success and stuff, but um, I feel like what comes what comes with a lot of success is also hardships. Yeah. Like, what are some hardships that you face? Oh man, that's a, that's, a real, <laughs> that's a real. That's a good question. That's a real good question. Man, no matter how successful you are, I feel, excuse me, as an artist, um, sometimes we're still sensitive. Yeah. Because art is an extension of who we are. And no matter how much of a business guy I am or blah, 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 that feeling of rejection still is real. So sometimes when you really want something to happen and it doesn't happen, and then, I mean, quite naturally, especially in in the Instagram yeah. era, and you're you looking at your it. peers <laughs> and all that stuff, you really have to remain grounded because, I mean, that stuff is an easy distraction, right? So for me, I've built a community of like-minded people around me where we try to encourage each other to kind of be, continue your path, right? It's the process, the process. And I think it's so, sometimes, even for me now, you have to remind yourself of the process mm -hmm. because... Yeah, I mean, the game is peaks and valleys. You can get one year I got six nominations, next year I got no nominations, you know? And I mean, sometimes as a real, a real emotions and as artists, like mentally, you give so much as a producer and as a writer, like that's your life service, you know? Sometimes that service bear incredible fruit. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's like, all right, cool, well, you didn't you didn't place anything this year. So we're moving on to the next hot person. So you have to continually reinvent yourself. So those it takes a lot of mental strength and a lot of good people around you to keep you grounded because it really it really can tear your morale and spirit down when you're constantly yeah. it's like, man, but I was hot yeah. last week. Was, yeah. You know? Exactly. And that's that's as real as I can give it to you. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, dang, like because Attention like spans is just like this. So, like, you constantly have to keep building and grinding and new relationships. And that's exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's probably the hardest thing that I've experienced navigating and then making sure that I'm present with my people I love. Mm -hmm. Because at the, in those valleys, you know, that's what really keeps you grounded in that love from people who love you because it's a transactional business. Mm -hmm. A lot of relationships are transactional. And you can be cool with people, but you got to know what it is. Yeah. It's like, all right, it's a transactional relationship. So who's here for me when the transactions are not transacting? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's Amen. not even the word, but Amen. I, you know. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so I would just say, like, really, like, be aware of that. And I think for me... I became aware of that really early. So I'm able to, and you still have those moments where it's just like, man, I ain't feeling it today. Yeah. Or like, man, I'm I'm exhausted. It's mentally exhausting. Um, again, you start getting family and then you establish a lifestyle for yourself and you want to maintain mm -hmm. that lifestyle. It doesn't even have to be like 50 million cars, but whatever is comfortable for you and yeah. your family. And then you go to executive, and especially now, who are not musicians and they're like, I don't know, man, you know, I don't know, you know, can you, what is that, a shaker? What is that, a, you know, and it's like, this idiot, you know? So you got to yeah. deal with that too, yeah. you know? It's an analytics guy <laughs> telling you about music, yeah, you know? So, yeah, you really just have to, that's, that's as real as I can give it to you. You will have those emotional, not only like financial peaks and valleys in the game, but emotional peaks and valleys. So, I mean, going back to being an entrepreneur and a good steward, understanding that it's a financial roller coaster as well. You can get a $500,000 check and your next check might be 50000 might be twenty. you know. So you have to learn how to navigate that and create business so you have those streams coming in continuously and that you can steward and establish your lifestyle comfortably. So if the money slow down... Yeah you're not really in a uh, compromising position. So, yeah. Yeah. Still be all right? Yeah. That's a good question. Who else? We got water here, too, if you want some. Oh, awesome. Yes, Daniel. Uh, I'm here to... Oh, nice. I know that music can be a very important aspect mm -hmm. of any theatrical performance. So, this is going to be a bit of a broad question, but 
how involved have you been in the theater in the past when it comes to music, even going as far back as to your time here at the Green Church? Yeah. Well, I did uh, The Impresario. Okay. Um, Hell Mozart. That was uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different experience. <laughs> right. Mike Stockings and powdered wigs. <laughs> um, but that was fun. Um, and to, to, to answer your question, even though I haven't worked a lot um, in theater in that aspect, um, I do... Uh, see what's happening. I, I have interest now mm. more than than ever to get involved. I have an idea that I want to kind of flush out and bring to theater, but I'm also now writing for film. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So um, I I had the privilege of serving with um, uh, I forget her name now. Uh, she's like a, a one of the top uh, music supervisors in, in Hollywood, but we served together as trustees with the Recording Academy. Mm-hmm. And um, we met and just had a conversation. And she was like, I want to work with you. You seem interesting. I love the way you talk about music and mm-hmm. art. And I wasn't super familiar with her at the time until I went back and I was like, oh, shoot. Like, you did August Rush and... Yeah. Um, Big time. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. uh, the... Stars Born, oh, Cocaine man. Bear, like she's the music supervisor for all these Jeez. movies, <laughs> right? And I'm just like, holy crap. So, um, and she's like, yeah, I spent like all day Googling before we got on the call, but I'm working on a project that I'm actually producing now, and I want you to write um, for the movie. Man. So she sent me the script, um, and I wrote a song for it she really loved and so we're doing different iterations of that song based off the script and stuff like that so now I'm kind of pivoting more into the movie and writing and what prepared me for that is writing to prompt for um, commercials oh okay right so um, Sony I'm I'm co-published by Sony so they send prompts out different commercials and and movies and stuff like that so I got a lot of good practice I did a uh a sync camp um, with Sony as well, um, which was very interesting. Just a total different, because you got to think about the characters, you got to think about the messaging, you got to think about, it's a little bit different than just writing, you know, yeah. for radio or for an album. It's a slight different skill. So um, I'm just now exploring that world more. Um, I'm excited to dive more into it, but yeah, it's been really cool kind of uh, dipping my toes into uh, a little bit of theater and, and um, television and film. Yeah. All right. Jacob. So I picked up uh, on you talking about growing up in the church. Yeah. Working with the chapel band here. Mm-hmm. It's actually interesting because I'm a chapel worship leader. Nice. With my friend, he over here. Nice. nice. And, um, <laughs> so I'm just curious, how has that background and like your faith journey kind of mm-hmm. related to your music career? Yeah. I think <clears throat> for me, my faith uh, journey has really kept me grounded, right? And and that's one thing I'm very um, proud of, mm-hmm. like just keeping my morals aligned, mm-hmm. right? So even if I'm in different rooms and stuff, just kind of like my posture as a person and my I never felt like I was so comfortable with my morals and who I was faith-wise. I never felt like I had to compromise to get anywhere where I wanted to be. Yeah. And believe it or not, people actually respect it, mm-hmm. you know, ultimately. Even if they're like, what, seriously, you're not doing this or getting down on that, blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, nah, this is not my my thing. And then sometimes it gives me an opportunity to talk about why. Yeah. And then sometimes your life is the biggest testimony anybody could could ever experience. And 10 years later, it may hit them like, wait, that dude was a little bit different or girl was a little bit different from whatever. So for me, that's always kind of been in the forefront. I never lost sight of that, even if I'm in and out of genres, right? Yeah. You know, that's just like my vocation to me. That's, you know, it's like... Yeah, I do R&B, I do da da da. That's my job. I go home, you know, like anybody else mm-hmm. who works anywhere. <laughs> and it's like, okay, that's my it job. Now I'm at up. home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for me, 
you know, my faith has always been at the forefront. Um, again, I grew up in church. That's mm-hmm. who, that's part of who I am. I embrace that. I embrace it in my music. I embrace it in my conversation. Um, you know, how I talk, you know. So I think it's every part of who I am and what makes why I'm in the room. Mm-hmm. So I never forget that. It's like I'm here because of my experiences of who I am as an individual. So why would I alter that? Yeah. You know, so um, if that answers your question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Answers it pretty well. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, since you do come from such a small town, yeah. what do you think, like networking wise, mm-hmm. what, what have you learned? I've learned that you never know who's the next person. That person could be sitting across from you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've always forged relationships. I never intentionally burn bridges. Um, and if I burnt a bridge and not aware of it and the person bring to my attention and I try to have a conversation, and just like, okay, what is it that happened, you know? But for me, I re- like relationships, um, you know, networking relationships will get you further than anything else. I was telling the smaller group earlier um, when I got to NYU, it was like, it was a few of us who, who ran in a little crew but um, I have a, a friend from, um, it was a friend from India and a guy from, uh, where was he from? Where was Justin from? I can't remember where he's from. Um, but we all hung together. And like nobody knew 10 years what everybody would be doing later. But my guy, Justin Davis, uh, now he's VP of ANR at Mercury. Um, my friend Jagar, he's now over all of the sound design at General Motors. And we often just like hit each other, like, yo, I'm doing this. Bro, all right, man, I got this project. Like my, my friend Justin, he was trying to sign an artist. He hit me, I want you to work with him. I was like, I can't do it. I have a writer who can do it. I sent him. The la- the label loved the record, gave the guy a deal. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I didn't, we didn't know mm-hmm. that he was gonna be VP. He didn't even know he was gonna be VP yeah. of NR at Mercury <laughs> at the time, because it wasn't in his the four, he was trying to be a producer. Like, I was a producer. He was a producer. Jagar was like, I'm going to be a Bollywood singer or whatever. Mm-hmm. So um, it just kind of, we had great relationship and just kept that camaraderie and kept in touch. Mm-hmm. And, like, when was that, 2010 we finished? Years later, it's like, I just hit him. It's like, what's going on? Dude, I just got promoted VP of NR. He was in marketing at first, Justin. Man. And so when I was, like, on my upward trajectory, mm-hmm. he was still like figuring it out in the building. He didn't he didn't have any hit records. Now I could have easily been on some like, and like whatever, boom, like I'm running with these people now. Blah, blah, blah. Like, this is my guy, he's dope. I genuinely connect with you. I think you're really dope as an individual. And now he could put checks in my account. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and Jagar the same, the same. He's like. He just hit me like he hit me one time. I was like, yo, can you help me with something, something? And I was like, yeah, I got you, whatever. And he's like, all right, thank you. A few years later, he hit me like, man, I'm looking for some sound designers. And I'm like, for what? And he's like, <laughs> I do all the sound at General Motors. I was like, what are you talking about? They need sound? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I was like what do you mean? He's like, I calibrate the speakers. Like, yeah. when you turn on the cars, like, the the uh, on the GPS and the sounds and the chimes and stuff. Like, I assemble all those teams. And I'm like, you got to be kidding it's me. insane. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I have endless stories like that from executives who were – um, assistants who would meet me um, when I would go to the buildings and there would be the secretaries to the executives, mm-hmm. nice to them. Because my theory is somebody got to be next, mm-hmm. right? And if I connect with you as a person, then I'm going to, on a human level, I'm going to always just keep that authenticity about me. Now, if I don't like you and you're a secretary, I'm not going to like you if you're an executive. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just me. Yeah. But um, from a small town, I realized, like, community. And I think that's what I learned coming from a small town. Community, community, community. Cast your life. Mm-hmm. You know, surround yourself with like-minded people, um, even if they're uh, the security guy at the moment, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, there's so many executives who are executives now. When I was, we are all kind of coming up at the same time. And now they're running labels 
or running, you know. I had a guy hit me the other day who was managing um, like a no-name songwriter when I met him. And now he's VP of NR BMG. And he's like, I'm working on this artist. Um, I forget the band name. Uh, Why can't I? Something like that. One of the guys mm-hmm. from that band is doing a solo album, a big band. And he's like, bro, send me some records. I'm VP now. And it's like, <laughs> he said, I made the decision. Right, now. right. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I got you. You know what I mean? So just these are people like genuinely in my community of network. And that's how it works. You know, it's like you look out, I look out, you look out, I look out, that kind of thing. So if that helps yeah. put things in perspective, yeah. Yeah. Any more questions for Phil Salad? <laughs> All right, David. I'm going to ask you, uh, I guess, one closing question. Okay. Um, and my question for you is, like, what's been the uh, source of your inspiration you, you, and stuff you, these uh, these last years? The source of my yeah, what? Yeah, inspiration these last years. Oh, man. Now I've shifted to legacy-driven mm-hmm. things, right? Um, I have kids now. Yeah. So... My inspiration is slightly different. Um, it's leaving something for them tangible and untangible. Yeah. Um, so, you know, everything I get involved with is about building something, you know, for them, whether it's at the university, uh, NYU, um, the courses, um, the course that I created mm-hmm. at NYU that's part of the curriculum now, African-American music mm-hmm. is origins and influence. Um on pop music, um, it's something that I want them to look back on and say, you know, dad was part of that, yeah. right? So I'm I'm getting a little bit older now, so my focuses are a little bit different, mm-hmm. you know? Um, it's not, I mean, yeah, I'll take 10 more Grammys, yeah. line them up, you know, a few more <laughs> enemies, Emmys, um, a few more hit records, uh, you know, there are still goals that I, that as an individual I want to achieve um i feel like i'm just scratching the surface yeah. honestly but uh, i think the forefront is really legacy is really about leaving something for them and sharing with them yeah. you know and just creating that environment of them knowing that they can accomplish um whatever their individual goals are you know yeah. and kind of just looking back over my trajectory and in my life and saying all right cool like I have the tools and access to things to kind of further what I'm trying to do. So that's the real inspiration, you know, about everything. When I don't feel like getting up, it's like, all right, cool. I got to get up. Yeah. And get get to work. Make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Man, that's great, man. Um, Well, David, thanks so much for for coming in, man. Thank you. Once again, congrats on all the accolades, Grammy, Emmy as well. Thank you. Um, And there's many more to come. So we're looking forward to it as well. Absolutely. Um, Where can the people follow you if they want to, you know, tune into what you got going on in life? Absolutely. If Swag did it, Mm -hmm. that's my Instagram. Um, If you want to email me, if Swag did it at Gmail. Excuse me, but my I don't use Twitter really anymore. But my threads and <laughs> Instagram is if swag yeah did it swag with two G's nice and uh, yeah you can follow my crazy life whenever I post stuff yeah man it's entertaining sometimes it is it is the uh, the, gra- <laughs> the graduation photos what was it was funny the other day um, <laughs> oh yeah yeah I deleted them I hit them. <laughs> Man, well, David, thank you so much again, man. We hope to have you back here again soon. Yeah. Um, And, yeah, we wish you all the best, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely.